How many were here on Wednesday night? Elevate night was ridiculous. Oh, my God. The presence of God in this room was so tremendous. We had such an incredible time together. And I encourage you, if you didn't hear the message, listen to it. Because I talked about how to get rid of the residue of 2019 and how to come in fresh in 2020. So go on our YouTube or Facebook Live or podcast and listen to the message. I really believe it's going to bless you. But today I want to bring us back to see beyond because it's, it's great that everybody wants a new year. But how many know that in order to have a new year, there must be a new you? There, you can't have a new year without a new you. There's just no possible way. So it's not that the calendar, you know, was flipped from 2019 to 2020. Now, great, my whole life is better. No, no, it isn't. You and I have to make that decision, that personal decision to decide what kind of year you're going to have. Every single one of us hopefully have this passion, this desire to, to live large this year, to live strong, to live committed, to live disciplined. Everybody say discipline. How many would like to have some discipline in 2020? Yeah, everybody wants discipline until they're disciplined. Amen. Right? Everybody says, ah, yes, I'm going to be disciplined in my workout. And then you get disciplined. Like, man, where were you? Why didn't you show up? Right? That's the way Jesus says, hey, man, where are you? Why aren't you following me? Why aren't you staying connected with me? Stay disciplined. Amen. Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30 through 31. In 2020, the scripture says this. That makes it quite clear that none of you can get by with blowing your own horn before God. I love this because basically he's saying, he's saying you can't keep doing things your way and think that you're going to get some God results. In other words, you have to stop blowing your own horn saying that, well, this is who I am, this is what I do, and it works good for me. Well, the reality is, is I'm sure that if you really want a new year, then there has to be a new you, so we got to stop blowing the doot-doot-doot, right, the little, you know, margarine horn, and say, no, I need, I need, I need God. I don't want to be blowing my horn in 2020. I want to yield myself. I want to humble myself this year. I really want to find out what God wants to do in my life, and the verse goes on to say, it says, uh, you can't be blowing your horn before God. He says, everything that we have, everybody say everything. That means everything of you, everything that you have. He says, you're right thinking, you're right living, a clean slate, and a fresh start. It only comes from God by the way of who? Jesus Christ. And so you can do life this year on your own and keep trying to figure that out. Or you can partner with God and say, you know what? I'm going to accomplish this life this year with Jesus and I love this because in order for there to be a new you in this new year we have to rearrange some things in our life he tells us in the verse what needs to be rearranged let me move your furniture around for a little bit okay this is what we need to rearrange he said you need to rearrange yourself with right thinking ever say right thinking Okay, that means that this year you have to put on the mind of Christ. You don't make decisions based on how you feel. You make decisions based on what God said. Like, what is God saying? Like, we prayed for Iran. We prayed for the U.S. We prayed for Iran. Okay, I can be very opinionated and say, yeah, Iran got what they got, man. And I can go hatred. Or I can really see God and be like, God, what do you think about this? What does the Bible have to say about what we're experiencing? What does God have to say about these final days? What is God saying about all this that we're experiencing? And so I have to get the mind of Christ about the situation. It's called the wisdom of God. We need the wisdom of God. But that requires a renewed way of thinking. That goes for me too. Pastoring this church this year, I'm changing the way I think. I'm not leading this church in 2020 like I led it in 2019. So get ready for change. Amen? Okay, he also said in 2020, I want you to have a vision for right living. Everybody say right living. And let me tell you something. This is the year where you have to say, I really need to get very in tune with the Holy Spirit. Because think about it. The Holy Spirit is the one who convicts you. The Holy Spirit, the Bible says, is the one who leads you into all truth. We need the conviction of the Holy Spirit. We need the holiness of the Holy Spirit. We need some clean living in our life. Amen. Spiritually, emotionally, physically, this body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Amen. It means that I am a living sacrifice in this body for God. I need some right living. 
He also said this, but you can also have a clean slate. How many are ready for a clean slate? Come on, a start over, a reset. Well, that doesn't just happen, you know, automatic. That you, you and I, we have to make some rearranging of our life. We have to make some changes, but all this comes from God by the way of Jesus Christ. And as I was preparing this message, I was thinking about, you know, just uh, this whole thing about see beyond, you know, like, what does that look like for us as a church? And we're going to be spending the whole month on this subject. But uh, when I was about six or seven years old, you know, we, uh, I, grew, I grew up in the ghetto, man. It was in, we grew up poor, P-O-R. We couldn't afford the extra O. It was that poor. And, uh, and so I lived in those, and for some of you that may have grown up this way, I lived in those type of apartments that had a courtyard, but it was surrounded by gates and barbed wire. You know what I'm saying? Like, you don't know if you were in a prison or if you were, it was pretty bad. And my mom, when I was six and seven years old, so it was around that age, she would say, you are not allowed to go beyond those gates. You are to play in the courtyard. And a six, seven-year-old kid, you know, you just want to run around. You know, you want to be free. And so, sure enough, you know what, I started playing day one, and I'm playing in the courtyard, and I can still remember the apartment building and everything, and let me tell you something, I grew up in a neighborhood where people were being killed in broad daylight, like broad daylight, just people being murdered, and gang violence, and drugs, just a very bad environment, and I remember playing there, and I would always look at the gate, and you know what, curiosity started kicking in, like, what is beyond those gates, you know, you start thinking, like, what is my mom keeping me from? Like, what is she holding me back from? And by day three, I went out the gate. And it was like, wow. Like, it was like, oh, my God. You know, I mean, I started seeing things that were six, seven years old, mind you. Okay, so I, I started young on the streets. And I was out there. I started making a bunch of friends with all kinds of crazy people, murderers, and all kinds of stuff. I mean, it was not good. Okay, I'm just telling you that. But it was a whole other world. <laughs> and, I, and I share this with you because, you know what, I know that there's, there's, there's boundaries. And I get that God has boundaries for us. But I think that sometimes we take God's description of boundaries and internally we create limitations. See, boundaries keep you from destruction, but limita limitation keeps you from ever stepping beyond who you are right now, what you have right now, who you can be right. You know what I'm saying? So God is saying to us right here, right now, on the first Sunday of January, it's time to see beyond, regardless of your age. Listen, age is an attitude. That's all it is. So if you're, you know, a little bit older, get over yourself. You're breathing. You're alive. You're right here. You should celebrate God. And if you're super young, get going, man. Wake up. Don't wait till you're 35. Amen? Like, start now. I don't care if you're 17, 16, 15. Let's get going. And so God has boundaries. But I think what we have done is we created so much limitation of what God wants to do in us and what God wants to do through us. Some of you are overqualified for where you are. But you're comfortable. Some of you have had a dream from like too many years ago, and you're still not doing it. Some of you have had dreams of writing songs, writing books, taking this vacation. I don't know what it is, starting that business. Like there are only dreams. But at some point, you got to go from just dreaming, right, from daydreaming to let's bring that dream alive. But you got to take off the limitations, you got to remove that. Let me show you what this word beyond means so you understand what I'm preaching on. The word beyond means to go, it means going past the place outside or after a stated limit. Some of you have already stated your limitation. Some of you have already, uh, you, you've convinced yourself that, that you're not going to go in. For example, when you look at the children of Israel, Okay, the Bible says, and I believe it's in Exodus, that the children of Israel ate themselves out of the promised land. Like you can literally be so consumed with, with, with you that you literally can talk yourself out of God's promise or convince yourself out of God's promise. Where in 2020, God's saying, you and I need to hook up, we need to link up, and you need to convince yourself into the promise, into the dream, into the vision I have for your life. Can I get an amen? amen? 
Come on, we got to, listen, we're so good at, at convincing ourselves of what we can't do. We become so proficient at that, so efficient. God's saying, stop it. Come on, I'm bigger than that. He's God. He says it's time to go past. We got to go past the place like the gates right there in the little apartment building. I went past those gates. I mean, oh, I mean, it was dangerous out there. But I mean, I made friends, praise God. I'm alive. I made it. Thank you, Jesus. You know, and for you kids, you make sure you obey your parents, okay? When they say don't go. Th- a stated limit. Don't be living a stated limit. You got to live unlimitless with God. So what's past your economic situation right now? What's past your economic situation right now? Can you see beyond your economy right now? Can you see beyond your finances? Like what's, what's beyond right now? What about your job? What's past your job right now that you need to see beyond that God wants to bring you into? What's, what's, what's past your commitment to Jesus Christ? Because, you know, some of you maybe, you, you know, you love God, you love God, but you're not really committed to God. You know, it's like I go to church when I feel like I need to go to church or I go to church when I'm in trouble or I go to church when it's the holidays, right? Like there's the, the, the Christian bunnies, right? That's Easter. And then there's, then, then there's the, the Christmas holiday Christians and then they come on ho- But maybe, maybe you need to start seeing past. I'm not, hurt, I'm not, listen, I'm not hating on you. I'm just saying it's time to look past. It's time to remove the limit and start being committed and say, this is the year where I'm going to be completely sold out for Jesus Christ. I'm all in for Jesus. Amen. Do you guys remember the acronym I gave you on faith? If you, if anyone in this room can get it, I'll give you a free latte today, man. I will hook you up. I'm, whoo, give it up. Give her a better big hand. You know you're just hating. Thank you. At the end of service, you will get a Starbucks gift card with $2.99. I'm just going to hook you up. I'm going to hook you up. Don't worry. That's awesome. Yeah, it's, it's forsaking all. I trust him. That's faith. That's what you're going to have to do in 2020. you got to forsake all. And some of that forsaking all is going to also include forsaking some relationships that you got to get out of that have been toxic, that have been limiting you, that have been keeping you small-minded, that have been keeping you in a place of hurt. And you have to decide personally that I'm going to start forsaking all. That includes your ideas, your ideology, your theology. Because I know, listen, everyone here has their own theology, whether you like it or not. In, in February, I'm starting a new series called Dangerous Theology. And we're going to get in this bad boy. Thank you for that one person. You're not getting a latte. But anyways, that was really good. But we all have to get to this place where we have to realize that, man, it could be dangerous what I believe right now for all of us. And so God wants to elevate. God wants you to see beyond. Let's go to Philippians 3.13. Look at this. So Paul drops some really pretty down-to-earth wisdom nuggets. He says, uh, no, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it. In other words, he, he's got goals. He's got vision. He's like, man, I haven't gone there yet. I'm, I'm going that direction. I'm not there yet. But check this out. But I focus on this one thing. What's the one thing you're going to focus on 2020? I was talking to Katrina at the 8 a.m. service or before the 8. I said, Katrina, what's the one thing you're going to focus on? What's the one thing you're going to crush in 2020? And she gave me her answer. But look at what Paul says. Paul says, the one thing I'm going to do in 2020 is I'm forgetting the past and I'm looking forward. I'm looking beyond to what lies ahead. You have to make that decision. Listen, God can't even make that decision for you. It is, it is a choice. That's why today as, as, as I'm talking, I'm going to prepare us for our 21-day fast that starts next Sunday. Listen, we are fasting for a change we're fasting for a renewal. We're fasting for God's anointing that lifts the, lifts the, 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 the burden who destroys the yoke of bondage in our life. But we have to do that. And I know that not everybody. Listen, maybe in 2019, you sucked at fasting. You know, the, the Twinkie demon got you. And, and, uh, and you know, the, the pizza was talking to you. And you were, you know, you, know you, 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 you fell. And it just wasn't a great fast. But guess what? You don't have to repeat 2019. You have to forget the past. I wasn't good at fasting. I wasn't good at praying. I wasn't good at reading. Okay, get over it. You weren't good. So what? Now what? Now what are you going to do? 
what are you going to change this year? You know, maybe you weren't the kindest last year. You weren't the sweetest, right? Maybe you were very mean. Maybe you were very arrogant, prideful. Well, guess what? Forget about it. Forget about it, amen? <laughs> like, get over it. If not, you know what you're going to do? You're going to be walking with the same dust from 2019 into 2020 when Jesus told his disciples when they went through all kinds of rejection, he said, dust your chanclas, dust your sandals, get over it, and let's go, amen? You got to dust the, listen, dust off the dust of last year and get some new pair of shoes, amen, and go ahead and live the dream this year, all right? Everybody say, see beyond. see beyond. And so so Paul said, hey, this is what I've learned. I've learned that in my new year, I have to get over the past. I have to forget the past. Not that the past is not going to hurt sometimes, but I have to get to the place of healing. I have to get to the place where I have to look forward. I have to get to the place where I can see that God wants me to go beyond the courtyard of my apartment. Yeah. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. God wants to get us to get past our failures, past our disappointments, past our hurts, past our insecurities, past our compromise. Some of us past our sin. We need to get past that sin because that sin will keep condemning you and putting you in a place of shame. Get past it. God wants you to get, repent, get your life right, right, right living, right thinking, a clean slate, a fresh start. But now let's move forward at some point. Amen. We've got to get past all the fleshly small thinking, get past your limitations. And I'm telling you, the only way you can do this is you have to start accepting that God does forgive your past. He does. You're not so far that God can't reach you. You're not so lost that God can't find you. He loves you, every single one of us. Paul, once again, he says, the one thing I do is I forget the past. And I look beyond. I look beyond. I love this verse right here that I'm going to read to you in a minute, but Jesus was obviously always hanging with his disciples, and, and they were watching him, spending time with him, touching him, feeling on him, right, seeing the miracles firsthand. How amazing is that? And, um, and how many believe that, that it's true, that you can be sitting in any church, whether it's Elevate or any church that you attend? Um, just because you're sitting in church doesn't mean that you're, you're seeing beyond or living beyond. You know, you can be a Christian that loves God, and that's cool. You love God, but you're not really active with God. You're not really committed to God. You know, you, you believe in God. You, uh, you have moments where you trust God, but it's not like this intimate personal relationship with God, which is what he wants in 2020. And so I say this because all of us here will have moments where we can literally be disconnected from God. Okay, listen to me. We can all be disconnected. Even me, the senior pastor, have had moments. Yes, Mauricio Ruiz. In the 23 years that I've been walking with Christ, there have been moments in my life where I felt I was disconnected in some way. It happens to all of us. And if you're right there trying to, you know, condemn or judge, let me tell you something, man. Every single human being on this earth finds themselves in a season of disconnection. Okay? But we got to stay connected. And, I sh and I'm going to give you scripture how this is true. So the disciples are rolling with Jesus, okay? And they are watching the miracles, the signs. Of one. They're seeing, obviously, Jesus' disciple. And he's showing them how they should live out on this earth. Matthew chapter 17, quickly, verse 15 through 17. This guy approaches Jesus. Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is an, epilep uh, for, uh, he is an epileptic and suffer severely, for he often falls into the fire and often into the water. So I brought him to your disciples. Look at this. I brought him to who? Disciples. Here we say, he brought him to me. Okay, you're, you're God's disciple, right? It says he brought him to his disciples, but they could not cure him. That must have been an awkward moment. Like, dude, you're just throwing us under the bus, man. What the heck? You know what I'm saying? Just picture that. Then Jesus answered. Look at so here's Jesus. He's talking to the guy. Anthony, come up here. So, you know, he's the dad talking about getting his son cured, you know. And stand over here, please. And you're telling me, you know what, your disciples, they couldn't cure him. And you're looking at me with this intent, like, please help me, please. You know, and he's doing this. And look at this. Picture this. I'm a visual guy. Picture this. Jesus listens to what he just said. And he goes...
You know, kind of like when you were sitting in the principal's office and the principal's telling your mom everything you did, your dad, and then after she's done talking, you as dad or mom, you do this. And you know what those, I, I'm a whoop, you're, okay, thank you so much. <laughs> well, Jesus didn't say that, but, but look at this. Look, look, listen, listen, listen. So I brought him to your disciples. So I brought him to Anthony. Anthony couldn't do nothing. That sucks, huh? That's like really throwing someone under the bus. Then Jesus answered, look at this. He turns around, gives his disciples the look, and this is what he tells, tells them. He said, oh, faithless and perverse generation. Listen to this. They're walking with him every day. Now he's calling them faithless and perverted. That means that you and I can be sitting in church faithless and perverted as well. If the disciples can be faithless and perverted and walking with God, let me tell you something. You and I can also be perverted and faithless. Let me explain that so don't get offended. Slow down. Some of you are like, what the? I'm just a visitor today, man. Chill. <laughs> I didn't say it. Jesus said it, all right? Don't hate the preacher. He, you know, he, I'm just the messenger. How long, listen, look at what he says. You faithless and perverted generation, how long shall I be with you? How many more sermons do I have to speak to you? How much more of my presence do I need to show you? How much more of my love? How much more of me trying to convince you that I'm real do I have to do? He's basically telling them, listen, you've been walking with me. I've been showing you miracle signs and wonders. I've healed you. I've restored you. I've delivered you. I've done all these things and you still can't get it? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him here to me. So basically, there's two things that he says. He says this to his disciples. There's two reasons why you can't cure this point. Number one, you're faithless. Everybody say faithless. In other words, you are the unbelieving believer. You're the unbelieving believer. You believe, but you're unbelieving. And that makes you faithless. He says you're not faithful. You're disconnected from me. In other words, you're walking with me, but you're disconnected from me. How is it possible that you have me in your presence in the flesh and you can't cast out this demon off this young little boy? And then the second thing he says, he says, and you're perverse. Everybody say perverse. Listen, perverse has to do with when sin clutches your heart so deep where that sin just can't let you go. It just holds on to you. Or you hold on to it and it just you just can't. That means that it's possible to be a good Christian, right? A good Christian and be faithless and be perverse right now. But don't don't worry, there's 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 joy at the end of this. So so the disciple basically became limited of God's power because they became doubters and obviously not connected enough. Can I get the pianist, please? Jesus called them perverse. Let me give you the definition of perverse. Very simple. It's not connected with me, but too connected with the world. That's all perverse means, okay? When there's more world in you than there is God. In other words, you put more value on what the world has to say than what God already said. That's perverse. It's twisted. It's when you believe more of your feelings than you believe God's spirit in you. That's perverse. It's twisted. And it, and it comes and it holds us in bondage. Are you hearing me today? So it's easy to not be connected enough to the Holy Spirit. Like, listen, on Wednesday night we had a, a, a move of the Holy Spirit. It was beautiful. But that was, that was a service experience. But it can be where you're just waiting for an experience here for a service when you and I are to be more connected with the Holy Spirit in our personal life. He can, listen, he convicts us. He, he's the one that guides us. He directs us. He comforts us. He, he leads us. The Holy, we need more of the Holy Spirit. You can be not connected enough to worship. Like you come here and you're sitting here or anywhere and you're worshiping. Or you're not worshiping because you're letting your feelings dictate what your body's going to do next. Not enough. It's perverse. Now I get it. If you're someone, you're like, well, I don't, I don't have to, I don't feel I have to lift my hands. Well, read your Bible because the Bible talks about lifting hands, lifting praise, giving a clap, giving a shout. If it's scriptural, let's do it. Amen. 
yeah, let's stop saying, well, that's not who I am. And I would, I would agree that you're right. That's not who you are, so start being who you were called to be. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Amen? Yeah. You're right. Come on, not connecting enough to God's word. And his disciples couldn't get past it. His disciples couldn't get past the idea that they could not heal. That they couldn't get past it so much that they get with God because they're, they're talking. To, they're like, man, how is it that we cannot fix this problem? Maybe right now you're facing some problems. Or maybe you're about to face some problems. And let me tell you something. God wants to give you the power and the authority to overcome every single problem with his wisdom, with his insight, with his revelation. But you're going to have to know, how do I do this? I'll show you how. Matthew 17, verse 18 through 20 says, And Jesus rebuked the demon, so he goes and he takes care of the kid now. It says, And it came out of him. And the child was cured from that very hour. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, uh, Why could we not cast it out? In other words, what am I not doing that I need to start doing? I've been long enough with you, Jesus. I've been walking with you long enough. Why is it that I still can't live for you? Why is it that I still can't be committed to you? Why is it that I still can't believe you for those kind of miracles, signs, and wonders? Why? That's a good question, isn't it? So Jesus said to them, because of your unbelief. You're not believing me for more. He says, for surely I say to you, if you have faith as, as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. I love this. So how do we fix the problem? How do we get the right thinking? How do we get the right living? How do we get the right clean slate, that fresh start? How do we do this? Matthew 17, 21, here's how Jesus tells them, you really want to know how? He says this. He says, here's how. However, he says, your first problem was unbelief. You lacked faith. You stopped believing me. Just like many of us, you can be walking with God throughout the year, and all of a sudden you stop believing him. You're just like, you're mad at God. You're upset at God. He says, however, not only is it an unbelief issue, he says, but this kind does not come out except by what? Prayer and fasting. There are some things in your life right now that you have been trying year after year after year, you're trying to get rid of it. You're trying to get it out. Guess what? It, it's not going to come out because there are certain things in your life that can only come out through prayer and fasting. And all of you know what's that one thing that you need out of your life that is sucking the life out of you, that is sucking the joy out of you. There's something, but it, it could be a bad relationship. It could be a bad community. It could be a bad attitude. It could be a negative point of view of life. There's something in you that you have been dealing with over and over, and it's like a cycle. It's always on reset, but guess what? It only comes out through prayer and fasting. See, some of us say, well, I've already done that. Yeah, but were you committed to your fast? Were you faithful to your fast? Huh? We can start something, but... We often stop the things. And listen, here's fasting. Simple definition of fasting. Fasting is refraining from food for a spiritual purpose. That's all fasting is. It's amazing how the doctors, if they check your cholesterol and they find that your cholesterol is high, what do they put you on? What kind of fast do they put you on? They tell you not to eat what? Red meat. Right? And we're like, well, if you eat red meat, you can get, you know, if you, if you keep getting this cholesterol high, you're, you're, you're bound to have a stroke, a heart attack, whatever, Right? If, if they diagnose you with diabetes, what do they put you on a fast on? No sugar. And it's amazing when the pressure's on and the doctor's saying, you're going to die, man, if you don't stop that. And you're like, okay. And then you start fasting meats. You start fasting sugars. But then when it comes to our spiritual life, how is it that we won't fast and pray? If you need a fresh touch from God, you fast. And you pray. If you feel like, man, you, you, you've lost your spiritual edge, you fast and you pray. If you feel that you've been disconnected from God and you're not feeling his presence, you fast and you pray. If you feel that you've been weary and tired and, and you've been dealing with a lot of unbelief, you fast and you pray because that will build, build faith back up again. Whatever it is that you're dealing with, let me give you the power and importance of fasting, and let's get out of here. Fasting was an expected discipline in both Old and New Testament. For example, Moses fasted twice for 40 uh, day periods. Jesus fasted 40 days. Remember that? 
and his disciples, he told, when you fast, not if you fast, he said, when you fast. So it's not an option. He says, when you fast, Paul fasted three days, and then God gave him his mission for his life. Fasting, number two, fasting and prayer can restore the loss of your first love, Jesus. Fasting comes from a genuine desire of deeper intimacy with God, with the Lord Jesus, from the knowledge of God. Fasting is a biblical way to truly humble yourself in the sight of God. David said in Psalms 35, 13, he said, I humble myself through fasting. Fasting, number four, enables the Holy Spirit to reveal your true spiritual condition. Because a lot of us can be like, I'm good. Okay. Let's go ahead and dethrone King's stomach and let's see how good you are. Because this flesh is not going to draw you any closer to God. The flesh is going to draw you further away from God. The spirit is going to draw you closer to God. Amen. So it will really show you your spiritual condition resulting in brokenness, repentance, and a transformed life. You'll start repenting a lot while you fast. Like, Lord, forgive me. Why? Right living. Oh, my God, Lord, forgive me. I need to get rid of this lust. I need to get rid of this, this anger. I need to get rid of this complaining, this negative attitude. It's, it's sinful. Amen? Number five, fasting allows the Holy Spirit to quicken the word of God in your heart, and his truth will become more meaningful to you. Right now, maybe sometimes you read the Bible, it means nothing. You hear a message, and it's like, man, it's like dead ears. Amen? When you fast and you pray, your spiritual ears will open. Your spiritual eyes will literally be unveiled, and you'll be able to see what God wants to show you. But it happens when you fast and pray. Fasting can transform your prayer life into a more richer and more personal experience. When you pray, man, you'll weep. I'm telling you. You'll start weeping. Just You know why I'm crying. You're just like, man, why? It just makes you so tender. Fasting, number seven, can result in a dynamic connection and personal revival in your own life and make you a channel of revival for other people's lives. Amen? You can literally be like that, that flame of fire that will light up everybody in your row. Like if nobody lifts their hands in your robe, but man, as you're, you're praying for them, Lord, I'm praying that my fire just um, lights them up. Amen. Let them have a connection with you too. Number eight, fasting refocuses what's been blurred and you focus on eternal things. And I think so often we can focus on goals and vision and all that, but we forget eternal things. We forget that people need salvation. We forget that people need healing. We forget that people need to also find a church like the one you're attending, where God is meeting them every single week. We have to fast and pray. Do I still care that my family's going to hell that are far away from you? Do you still care about that? Or did you already give up on them and say, ah, they're going to go to hell anyways? I don't know. Seriously, people think like that. Your coworkers, do they even know you're a Christian? Do they know that you're a believer? Do they know you're a follower? Well, let me tell you something. Fasting and prayer will break out your boldness and your courage to share Jesus with them in some way. That's what fasting will do. Are you hearing me today? Prayer is connecting with God. Fasting is disconnecting from the world. Prayer is connecting back with God. Fasting is disconnecting from the world. I pray to connect with God, but I'm fasting to disconnect from the world. When you think like that, when you believe like that, let me tell you something. Something amazing happens. Last week I told you that there was something that, that I have been believing God for for many years to one day do. <clears throat> I've been in ministry now with my wife for full-time ministry for almost 20 years. 20 years, two decades been walking with Jesus Christ for 23 years. So three years of going to church like you, uh, serving in church for those that do serve, and then full-time ministry, man. I left everything and went into full-time ministry, left an amazing career, making crazy, amazing money. Like God really, when I got saved, God transformed me like crazy. And I went into full-time ministry. And for 20 straight years, we have been going hard. Now, if you know me personally, is there a lazy bone in my body? Mm -hmm. I'm passionate. Man, I will work hard. And, um, but one thing that I'm, it's almost like the veil is being removed as well to be able to see, you know, do we want this thing to be long term or do we want this to be for many, many years? And throughout the years, as a pastor, for many pastors, let me tell you something, and not every pastor you know, does this because of 
you know, just being limited of staff, being limited of leadership, and it just be, becomes very difficult. But if you think about throughout the years, for example, you start going through like this emotional series of stresses. And let me explain this. Just because I'm a pastor doesn't mean that I don't have stress in my life or worry or any of that that we all go through. I know how to overcome it, but I experience it. But when you think about all the different stuff, and I had to write this down because I'm thinking like, wow, you know what? We minister to a whole lot of people, not just in this little building. No, we don't do that. We minister to a whole lot of people globally, okay? And I started writing down, like, hey, Mauricio, what are some of the things that you've been doing with your wife for 20 years that has been a journey of emotional stresses? Well, let me break them down for you. 20 years of this. Are you ready? I'm like, you're going to hear it. I got you here. Nobody get up. Because I want you to hear this. Funerals. Emergencies. Standing and believing for miracles, not just with one family, but multiple families. Who have loved ones in hospital beds, cancer, people with co in comas, you name it, like nonstop for 20 years. Good criticism. Bad criticism. Making sure everyone... Uh, that's attending here is love, accepted, appreciated, valued, challenged, corrected, instructed, then loved again. School shootings, okay? We were one of the first responders when the shootings happened here in Santa Clarita. Okay, then I was a part of the vigil. Then then I got called from the cemetery for all the families that have buried, like any family that they've buried, they asked me, can you come and do this, sir? Like it's an emotional, it's heavy. It's heavy. Mind you, this has been 20 years of a lot of stuff. Uh, tragedies, leading a congregation closer to God, developing people, discipling people, crying with people, church hurt. And let me tell you something, that is an ongoing holiday in every church in America. It doesn't go away. Forgiving people. Outreaches. And how many know that this church does a lot of outreaches? Fighting child human trafficking. That is my wife and I's passion, is we fight child human trafficking in Mexico. Uh, meeting with government officials in Mexico, meeting with the Attorney General of Mexico, meeting with all kinds of, of political people, leading them, talking to them, pouring into them, convincing them to save lives, amen? That's a lot of work. Um, a school in Oaxaca that we have from elementary through high school, leading those children. Oaxaca, Mexico is 50 years behind in education. We're trying to bring revival and reformation of education, amen, as a church. Um, Spiritual warfare. We haven't even included that part. There's a devil. Amen. He hates us. Listen, financial responsibility to keep every single part of God's vision in this church alive and moving forward. Sermon prep. Let's not even get into that. Okay. That takes a lot of time. You know, uh, we preach 11 times a month. And you add that by the amount of minutes and the amount of people we minister to. We travel and we speak at other uh, leadership conferences and different stuff, and I can just go. Now, everything I just shared with you didn't even didn't even include our life, my children, my marriage, my family. Everything has always been, and we've done a really good job. But it's always been about ministry, and I love ministry. We love ministry. We appreciate. It. We love you. But I also see in the last two years how many pastors have been committing suicide. You know why? Because they're tired, they're stressed, they're exhausted, they're going through stuff internally. And I don't want to be that pastor that has to wait for something. I'm, I'm good. I'm not exhausted. I'm tired. There's a difference between exhaustion and tired. Exhaustion is when you've lost your joy. Tired means I just need some rest. There's a difference. Because I got fire, man. I can keep, I, I'll keep going. That's just me. Y'all know me, man. I'll keep Let's do another event. <laughs> you know, win the world. That's just, that's just who I am. But, but I also realize that if we want to see the next 50, 60 years of Elevate Church, and let me tell you something, God is giving this church vision like crazy this year. Like, don't get too comfortable. I'm telling you, it's, we're about to just, it's so, but that needs, that needs us getting before the presence of God, getting refueled. It's not even go on vacation. No, we need to get ministered to. And we're going to get ministered to. We're going to meet with friends who are pastors and get ministered to. 
take some rest as well, take time off, get refreshed, get restored, get renewed. And then, uh, so what I'm planning to do is today is um, the, the Sunday before I take off this week. But I'm leaving you in good hands. I started calling a lot of my friends. Listen, they were all like, dude, we got you, man. I'm leaving you in the most amazing hands. Oh, yeah, so what I'm doing is called a sabbatical. <laughs> They're like, what are you doing? It's called a sabbatical. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. A sabbatical is when a pastor, and now listen, sabbaticals, normally pastors take three, four months off. I'm like, dang, how do they do that? Like, man, I'm not doing that. I'm doing four weeks. Four weekends of just shutting it off. I'm shutting off my media. I'm shutting off. I, want, I told my staff, don't call me. Don't look for me. No smoke. I don't, want, I, I don't want to hear nada unless someone dies, which, of course, we said this is the year of no destruction. Ain't no one dying. So I told him, like, so here's the deal. You ain't calling me. There's just nothing. We're disconnecting from everything that has to do with what we've been called to do. Amen? For a season of just complete. So I have amazing friends. Let me show you your, your, your lineup next, next four weeks. So I got Les Canoza, the bishop, the pontiff, and uh, he's a... Uh, He's a missionary from Zoe International who also combats child human trafficking. Let me tell you something. When this guy speaks, you'll cry. That's the anointing he has on his life. When he speaks, you're convicted. Okay, not that there's no conviction here. We have conviction here. But when this man speaks, man, I'm telling you, something shifts in the atmosphere. And Lesko knows it used to be the vice president of Bank of America. He left his business, his career, okay, to go into missionary work. So you're, I'm leaving you in mo most intelligent, brilliant hands and loves Jesus. How do you remember Pastor Mark Graham? He's a little crazy. That's why I'm bringing him. So notice my, my whole lineup is like an emotional roller coaster for you. Mark Graham, let me tell you something, man. You're going to get spit on. I'm just going to say that right now. No, the guy is a wild man, but he is a profound communicator oh my god this guy can preach the pain off any wall and he is bold he is wild but when he brings a word you'll start like okay where's he going and then he'll just slap you with it uh, and you'll be like what the you know where'd that come from and and just so much revelation you're gonna love pastor mark grant and he pastors a phenomenal thriving church that's blowing up right now uh in the inland empire then you have pastor kevin goff another amazing oh my god pastor kevin god listen I've known Les for over 20 years. I've known Mark Graham for eight years. I've known Kevin Goff for 23 years. These have all been great friends. Pastor Kevin is hilarious. Like Mark Graham. Mark Graham is just great. He's just, you're just going to see the difference. But uh, Kevin Goff is hilarious. And, man, he brings a punch. And uh, another great church, the Rock Church, that have many campuses. They're blowing up all over the place. And then uh, Mike Rovner, and I did this to mix it up. Mike Rovner is a business owner. He's a leader and a speaker. And let me tell you, this guy, you want to talk about a kingdom builder? This guy gives millions to, to ministry. Millions. I'm talking when he writes a check, he writes millions. When we first started this church, I've known him for 23 years. Okay, when we first started this church, man, we had nada. And I needed some help. And he came here and, you know, of course, I was going to pay him. And, and he did a lot of work in our church. And he said, Mauricio, I love you, man. That's for you. We, we love you. God. He's been a great friend. And uh, he'll be speaking here the last Sunday. And, uh, and I did that on purpose because I believe that there is an entrepreneurial anointing on this church in 2020. That God is going to bring some crazy prosperity in people's lives. And there's no one better than to have someone like that who is living it. Okay. Number one construction company in the entire state of California. This guy nets millions and millions of dollars and is a generous giver. And then you know what he is? He's an elder at his church. He loves his church. He serves his church. He serves his pastor. He's been a great, I've known him. I know his character. I know his integrity. So I'm leaving you in good hands. So what am I saying? I'm saying this. You can't miss one Sunday. If you truly care about my wife and I, no, seriously. Here's what the Bible says. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who labor, labor in vain. How many know me pretty well some way here at Elevate Church? Okay. Have I ever made it about me? Do I ever want your, 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 your praise or your, do I need it? I don't, I'm not that person. I've never made Elevate Church about me. It's always been about Jesus. I lead people to Jesus. It's all about Jesus. My wife leads people to Jesus. Jesus is the only one who heals. But the Bible says that unless he builds the house, those who labor, labor in vain. We're not laboring in vain. 
And so I'm encouraging you to not miss any Sunday just because I'm not here. If you start missing, then, then, then I'm nervous. I'm going to be like, oh, my gosh, were they here for Jesus or for me? Who were they here for? We're here for Jesus, amen? That's maturity. And I think we've done a good job here to always put your eyes on Jesus.